I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so uh, about the book in, in broad terms. So hopefully you can now see um, see my slide pack there. Um, and then uh, my uh, friend and former colleague, Professor Neil Barr, will, will, will talk a, a, a bit in a discussion format about the book and ask me some questions, which I'll answer. And then we'll go on to um, uh, questions from the audience. So, first of all, I thought I might talk very quickly about um, how I got into this and what it is particularly that the book is doing. Uh, obviously, the book is on the war in the Mediterranean. Uh, my initial interest in this area really was born out of my time as a student, undergraduate, master's student, um, about my interest uh, regarding the war in North Africa. Uh, from sort of 1940 to 43 during the Second World War and debates over things like uh, was it a war one on land or war one at sea? It's very funny things, very interesting. Um, amongst other things as a, as a master's student, of course, reading Neil Barr's book, Pendulum of War, on this uh, on, on the battles of Maine, for instance. Um, and over time, as I got into my PhD and then beyond then, uh, I've really sort of broadened out my view of the Mediterranean theatre um, helped in a, in a sense by a lot of fantastic new scholarship, um, which has come out in the past 20 years or so on, on these kind of subjects, sort of, amongst whom Neil is a contributor, of course, and broadened out sort of ideas into looking at this concept of a wider integrated Mediterranean kind of theatre of war. Um, something that uh, Michael Simpson, one of the people who's worked on this area from a naval standpoint, has said uh, the British look at the Mediterranean as a single geostrategic unit. Uh, this idea that actually the Mediterranean, in the sense of the Second World War, incorporates not just the Mediterranean Sea, but the, the other kind of constituent seas like the Aegean, Adriatic, Ionian, and so forth, uh, but also the surrounding littorals, North Africa, the Middle East, uh, the Balkans, uh, Southern Europe, things like South Spain, France, Italy, and the various islands that we find uh, in the Mediterranean region. Um, and actually, the fundamental kind of aim of the book then is to answer questions about how both sides attempt to uh, wage war across such a diverse kind of interconnected region that's held together by the sea. It's lots of islands within the sea. And then, of course, all these littorals surrounding and enclosing what is almost a, an inland sea. So what determines the final result and how do both sides try and uh, kind of wage war across this area. And um, what I found and the sort of the fundamental answer within the book is that everything is dependent on shipping. <coughs> and that is because everything is held together by these kind of maritime logistic networks, as I call them, by, by both sides, by both the allies and the Axis powers. And ultimately what determines victory is the allied ability to a sort of cause attrition to the Axis Maritime Logistics Network and sink large quantities of Axis shipping, German and Italian ships. Um, you might question whether or not we need another book on the Second World War, uh, let alone uh, the Mediterranean specifically. Do we actually even need that? Um, you will be shocked to hear that my answer to this question is yes, and hence I have published this book. Um, but uh, I found that particularly there is something that hadn't been done and people hadn't looked at it through this lens of kind of logistics within the integrated sense of the theatre. And in fact, um, there are books on the importance of, of air sea power, for instance, in the war as a whole. Uh, if you think back to the 1990s and, and, and Richard Overy's classic Why the Allies Won, or much more recently, um, Philip Payson O'Brien's book uh, on how the war was won air sea power in the Second World War. But both of these only talk in fairly passing terms about the Mediterranean. They're excellent pieces of work, both of them. So they don't talk too much about the Mediterranean for reasons that they go into specifically in their works. And similarly, there are books, articles, and all sorts of things on the importance of the Mediterranean to the war as a whole uh, by, say, Douglas Porch or, or Simon Ball. There is in the, in the introduction to the book a, a full literature review that discusses all of this. But again, these tend to discuss uh, the importance of the Mediterranean, but they don't look at the centrality of shipping to access war aims and how this helps them sort of fall apart. Um, 
And there are books on the importance of shipping in the war in a broad sense, things like um, going back a long way, CBA Barons on the merchant shipping in the Second World War, or much more recently, the work of someone like Craig Simons. But these all focus generally on the importance of shipping to the Allies as a kind of a global power. And that is extremely important that they don't look at it the other way around. Um, and finally, there are lots of books and other chapters, articles, all sorts of things on elements of the war in the Mediterranean and overviews of the war in the Mediterranean. Many recent excellent works, most of them focus 1940 to 43. There are a few excellent ones that cover later periods. My book does also cover a later period, but say Barbara Brooks Tomlin is a rare uh, example. Her book does do that. Until now, though, we really haven't had that kind of fundamental book that looks at the centrality of shipping. Uh, over the course of the war and how that helps determine the ultimate results. Um, so I've included a, just sort of a screenshot of my contents page on the left hand side as you look at it of, of this slide. Uh, and you'll see from that that the chapters of the book, chapters one to eight, are ordered chronologically really. Um, but while they're chronological in the chapters, there are lots of different themes that are discussed within them. And you'll see particularly chapters two to eight are structured in a particular way within three or four parts. Lots of different things that are, that are covered in that sense over the course of the book. Uh, the importance of the Mediterranean, for instance. Um, in chapter one, the descent of war in the Mediterranean it starts with a discussion of the importance of the Mediterranean to Britain specifically is an important Mediterranean power. Uh, and then really the first allied power in the Mediterranean when we get to the war. Um, uh, but the importance of Britain over a long durée, going right the way back to um, uh, the acquisition of Gibraltar in, in the early uh, 18th century during the War of the Spanish Succession, uh, it's important to bear in mind it's been important to Britain for a long period, the Mediterranean, important for trade, important for power projection, important for um, imperial purposes, and in particular after the construction of the, of the Suez Canal, um, the ability to have that sort of through route through the Mediterranean and access the Far East um, uh, and colonies like um, India, Ceylon, modern day Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, uh, or the dominions of, of um, Australia and the Pacific, to do that much more quickly than going all the way around the Cape of South Africa, for instance. So it looks at it in that sense and also looks at the more immediate pre-war importance of the Mediterranean links into later on I'll discuss war planning, but it's importance to the Allied and Axis coalitions and pre-war to the different great powers. And I've discussed already the integrated nature of the Mediterranean theatre, but, but then again, after that, we're going to, uh, in the first chapter, planning for war in the Mediterranean. So it looks from the, the British, French, Italian and German perspectives, really, how much does the Mediterranean matter and how do they plan for war there? Not so much the Americans, because in the 1930s, they're, they're largely trying to avoid war. And if they're going to be in the war, they're certainly not really thinking about the Mediterranean too much. But uh, for instance, particularly fascinating that in the 1930s, as the possibility with Italy, uh, war with Italy increases for Britain, there is a big ongoing debate, which I discuss in that chapter, about how do you uh, conduct war with Italy? And there are two broad schools of how to do so. Do you get a big kind of knockout blow against Italy using OK to feed them on land, but particularly sea power and then air power to bomb them? Or do you take a slower method of kind of strangulation, cutting off Italy from its, its, its necessary imports, severing the link between Italy and its, its various colonies? And it's actually that latter one, although that in the 1930s, there's never a conclusion to this debate, it just sits unsolved. There is a, um, uh, it's the strangulation school, which is much more closely followed when it comes to wartime, hence the title of my book. Um, also looking in wartime itself at the strategy that's employed in the Mediterranean by both sides. And I get in a bit, only so much as it influences kind of the, the importance of the argument. Um, but the debates over uh, strategy in the Mediterranean. Um, there are lots of arguments, Neil, for instance, has written about this, lots of arguments on the Anglo-American side about how much should we care about the Mediterranean. Um, it's much more important in a broad sense to the British perspectives of how the war should be fought than the American, for instance. Uh, and on the Axis side, lots of debates between the British and the, Italian, the, the Italians, intranational debates as well as inter as well. And then, of course, there's lots on operations uh, Air-sea integration is particularly important. I talk a lot about that in the book. 
Uh, also integration with the land environment in many ways. Um, there is a lot uh, in the book about inter and intra-service rivalries, and this links very heavily to integration. There are lots of arguments between the services about who controls assets. I go into this quite a lot in the book. Uh, where should assets go? Um, and lots of arguments, particularly between senior representatives and, and, and officials within the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force about who controls air assets that operate overseas and, and, and what should they be doing. Um, there's lots and lots of arguments there that are only ever kind of partially solved and it impacts on the effectiveness of operations lots of the time. And again, linked with these things, the question of learning and how they learn over time to develop both sides, to develop more effective kind of operations regarding the, the integrated war in the Mediterranean. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but also the centrality of intelligence within all of this and how do you integrate intelligence into your operations when intelligence is functioning effectively and well integrated. So there's good collection of data and it's integrated well into operations. Unsurprisingly, they go better when it's not so much available or not working so well. I'm surprised it's not really helping and it's a detriment. Um, and of course, logistics, which I've underlined because there's the fundamental nature of the importance of shipping and supply is all about logistics. But also, when I talk about the integration of the war on land, there's lots about in, uh, sort of logistics on land and supply troubles there. So, a couple of slides I'm going to talk through some of the arguments in very, very, very broad terms, arguments and contributions that I think that the book makes. Um, so, as I've mentioned, there's this broad argument within the book that the destruction of Axis shipping is absolutely fundamental to ultimate Allied victory in the theatre. Uh, so the interdiction of important supplies like fuel, ammunition, tanks, vehicles, parts, personnel, all these sorts of things that are sent to North Africa, um, that undermines the successful interdiction at key times during the war in North Africa, uh, say at Albania or say in Tunisia, or even earlier in say uh, late 1941, during a time called Operation Crusader, a British Army operation, um, there are times when it fundamentally undermines the Axis' ability to fight and it helps um, sort of enable the, the victories that take place there for the Allied forces in these different areas. Really important in that sense. And that's actually weighing in on an existing debate on my part, because there are some who argue it is important, some who argue it isn't. Uh, and I, I weigh in directly on those debates and, and say why I'm falling on this side and why those who argue against it, why I'm going against them and, and offer lots and lots of statistical and, and qualitative evidence. But also this broader argument that hasn't been made before about the overall importance of attrition. That means that ultimately, because they can't keep up the access with, with losses to shipping and they can't either repair or build enough new stuff or they can't seize enough things from elsewhere that they can't hold together positions that are important to their ultimate war aims. So they can't hold on in Tunisia in, in 1943, not just that they're being defeated on land, because they simply can't keep things supplied. Uh, they can't hold on to island bases like Sardinia and Corsica and the Aegean and all these sorts of things. And to give you a bit of a flavour from the book, I've included a couple of, of tables to show you some of the, the statistical data. Um, so you can see this table on the left here, 4.3, is an example of one that shows the percentage losses of cargoes. I've included this one because it has November 1941, 92% uh, of the fuel was sent to North Africa is lost. And that's an example of important operational sort of shortages during Operation Crusader that I've mentioned. Uh, on 1943, just look at the sheer totals. It's broken down by method, but also the sheer totals of shipping that are sunk, at least 50 ships a month often. Uh, more than double than that. Um, the, the tonnages are huge in the hundreds of thousands. So the losses are very, very heavy. And as I show elsewhere, more than the Axis can cope with. Uh, and the effectiveness is that of this campaign is, is really influenced by a lot of fluctuating factors over time, um, which I go into over the book. But questions of prioritisation of the Mediterranean theatre at the strategic level, the more the prioritise it, the better the campaign tends to go. What about resources in theatre as well? Where do they go? Are they used for the anti-shipping campaign? Are they used for other things? Um, do they have the right type of equipment or are those things being sent elsewhere? How are they developing new tactics, techniques, procedures, all these sorts of things? And also on the access side, what are they doing? How are they developing? Are they getting new equipment, new personnel? Do they have enough things 
where they're developing new procedures. Um, if you look at the pictures on the left, a couple of them are from the book, but the guy on the top left there, uh, John Kendra, I've included just a picture of him because he's an interesting example of, of the interesting sort of methods of learning that they use in the Mediterranean on the, on the Allied side. And he's someone who comes in, he gets a commission, but he largely comes in as a civilian. Uh, and he's there as a, a famous scientist, later wins the Nobel Prize, not anything to do with the wars in the 60s, um, but uh, comes in as an operational researcher and, and builds loads and loads of reports and builds the team of scientists that look into ways to improve. It's fascinating stuff, really. Um, and ultimately, I think this is really a, a sort of a new way to assess and evaluate and explain Allied victory in the Mediterranean theatre during the war. Um, and I go on to, in the conclusion, discuss why this matters. Um, not just why does it matter in terms of explaining victory in the Mediterranean, how this hasn't been done before, but also why does that matter in terms of the wider war? And I'm happy to discuss this more later, but things like the importance of smashing the Axis coalition and knocking Italy out of the war, the importance of attrition overall to the Axis powers and the concept of, of kind of closing the ring on them, as, as Churchill once famously said. Um, ideas of uh, reopening that through route through the Mediterranean, victory in the Mediterranean allows that, and then shipping that's so important to the global powers that are the Allied powers, they can uh, save lots of time and space and shipping that allows them to do other things. So Normandy is a good example, it's really helpful uh, having that through route reopened. And on the flip side, defeat there is, is embarrassing for the Axis, also noxiously out of the war, but early on, defeat of the um, and sort of blunting of early Italian offences, for instance, at a time when Britain uh, has lost its major ally, France, helps keep them in the war at a time when they're under huge pressure. And there's the, all the possibility they could take a negotiated settlement, for instance. And the other thing I really want to emphasise in terms of a contribution is this uses lots of new research, this book. There's archival research drawn from 12 different archives across three different countries the UK, USA and Italy, but I should say the first two of those, a lot of actually Italian and German material is available in them. Um, so there's a lot of British, American, Italian and German primary sources used throughout the book. And in some cases, they're things I've, I've not really ever seen elsewhere. Uh, so in the top right, you'll see a picture of a guy called Karl Kaufmann. He's not a hugely well-known Nazi official, um, known when he is known as a gal writer. But he's actually the, the commissioner for overseas shipping for the Reich from 1942 onwards. And a, a sort of set of papers of his has um, helped me, alongside a bunch of uh, Italian archival material, demonstrate that actually there was an insoluble shipping crisis for the Axis from late 42 onwards. Whereas in past it's been brushed off by historians to say, well, they've seized lots of shipping from France. But if you look at this guy's papers and these other Italian sources, and things, it demonstrates there isn't enough of that shipping and what they do have often isn't usable. They seize things that they can't actually can't actually utilize. And so I just thought it'd be fun to include a couple of examples of them here. But uh, on the top left, as you look at it, this is an example of um, minutes from high level Italian conferences uh, and incorporates um, a line in it uh, from the Italian Minister of Communications, Giovanni Hostventuri, about how um, uh, in late 1942, there's this big deficit of shipping, sort of about hundreds of thousands of tons of shipping short, that, that they are short by to fulfill their various requirements across the region. Uh, to the right of that here, this slightly yellowish looking one, uh, those are the Kaufman papers, that's the front page, uh, a snippet of the front page from them, which is quite interesting. And they're a really important source in the last two or three chapters. Um, uh, we've also got war diaries from the German Naval Staff Operations Division, but particularly for the latter stages after Italy is knocked out of the war, provides some interesting material, important stuff. And to the right of that, the red one, most of what is done regarding the maritime side of things in Mediterranean is done by the Italians. So this is an example of a, of a document from the Italian Naval Archives, the uh, Ufficio Storico della Marina Militare, which has a huge amount of largely untapped material. Um, which I've, I'm very grateful to certain people who've helped me access these things. Finally, I mentioned Kenja earlier on the bottom right. This is a compendium he wrote of different reports, sort of collated of different reports and discussion of, of where things are going and how to learn better for future operations. So just a snippet of some of the different things that he used, really. Um, so that's it from me. I'll hand over to Neil in a moment. I just want to quickly say thank you 
there are huge numbers of people to thank you. So if you want to know who I want to thank in terms of in terms of the book, read the read the acknowledgements because uh, there's a couple of pages there and I could have gone on much longer. But just in terms of this, thank you very much to to Lauren at CUP for all of their help and also Dan Iredale and more broadly at CUP. Thank you to Michael Watson as an editor for everything that he's done. Um, and thank you to Neil for agreeing to come on this and, and hopefully ask some very helpful questions that aren't going to skewer me. Uh, and just say you can follow me on Twitter and there's a link to my uh, Brunel profile. Thank you to Brunel University, I should say as well, and to the, to the book page as well. OK, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you, Richard, for that illuminating uh, talk. And uh, it's nice to uh, it's nice to be uh, joining you in a virtual space and uh, bring your webcam up as well so that everybody can see you. Um, it's no, it really is a real pleasure to be in this virtual space to celebrate uh, uh, Rich's new book. And uh, I just want to give a, a few uh, thoughts and comments uh, which hopefully uh, support uh, what Richard has, uh, has just said. And while the, the war in the Mediterranean and the war in North Africa, uh, I think today we can probably say has begun to fade from the public imagination. If we think about the way that this war uh, is thought of through the lens of public imagination, it tends to be thought about in terms of land campaigns. Uh, we think of Rommel and Montgomery. Um, if we think of uh, the, the few films which really uh, address the war at sea, not only in general in terms of the Second World War, but the Mediterranean in particular, there's really only two that I can uh, think of, uh, the Malta story, and in which we serve, uh, that wonderful film with Noel Coward. But even then, uh, those films don't focus on supply. They don't focus on, on, on the issues that Richard has really uh, addressed. Um, and when we think of the war in the Mediterranean, we think of the dramas of Greece and Crete, uh, of Benghazi, Tobruk and Alamein. And our eyes, whether we're talking about the public or even the attention of historians, uh, with some notable and honourable exceptions, we tend to have our focus drawn uh, onto the war uh, on land. And even when we've conceived of the issues of supply, we've tended to focus uh, upon their impact on the way that that uh, influences uh, the war uh, on land, uh, particularly uh, in North Africa. Um, and I think that means that we often don't think uh, about the war at sea or give it the full attention that it deserves, particularly not from a wider macro uh, view, because of course there are many uh, wonderful uh, naval histories uh, of the war in the Mediterranean. But they're often not perhaps as integrated with the wider story uh, as we would like, and that's one of the real features uh, of what Richard has achieved. And I think some of this is because it's difficult to conceive of campaigns when they're actually composed of multiple events, multiple small tactical actions, um, and each individual action can be really quite small. Um, you know, the sinking of a small Italian coastal vessel uh, in and of itself uh, might be seen as not important. It certainly doesn't have the drama, unless you're personally involved, it doesn't have the drama of a great battle uh, such as uh, Alamein or Crusader. But it's the accretion of these events it's each of these small events taken over time in this constant attritional struggle, which ultimately makes the difference. Uh, and I think that's what Richard has really been able to do. And uh, I, would, uh, I would suggest that one of the many striking features of this book are the way that it links to some of the wider factors of war. Um, it only becomes apparent, I think, in reading Richard's book, that it's the industrial production it's the shipping capacity, it's the war making potential of the Axis as a whole and Italy uh, in particular, which really reveals these weaknesses that in a long running attritional struggle, Italy simply doesn't have the resources, the production capacity, the repair facilities uh, or the workforce to really uh, wage this long running campaign. And that's what stacks up eventually to undermine the Axis capacity to prevail. And I think Richard reveals that very, very uh, clearly. So I think that's what Richard has been able to do to really understand this constant struggle uh, over convoys and shipping and how that ultimately determines this conflict. So 
Uh, in itself, I, I think this book is a, a major achievement and a real contribution to our understanding, not only of the Mediterranean campaign, uh, but the war uh, as a whole. Uh, and I heartily recommend uh, that you buy and uh, read Richard's book. Uh, and it's uh, wonderful to be able to, to celebrate uh, the launch of, uh, of his book with him. Uh, so I'm just going to ask uh, a couple of questions to get the uh, discussion going, as it were. Um, so my first question to you, Richard, is why do you think it has taken so long for a comprehensive study uh, of this clearly critical uh, uh, subject and issue to appear? Thank you, Neil, and um, thank you for the very kind words that you've, you've offered about the book um, and again for appearing on this. Um, I, I'd say there's probably a, a couple of reasons, but, but perhaps one of the most important things and sort of I linked to when I talked about one of the things a, that I'm most kind of proud about in terms of the book, but also helped me take this new perspective were with, with this new kind of source material I was looking at. Um, and I think a lot of the time, particularly in terms of the Italian source material, um, a lot of it was either unavailable or very difficult to access for a very long time after the war. Um, there are problems anyway with, with, well, with all source material, but with access source material for, for so much not surviving the war, but then also for what does, where does it go and, and how do you access it? Um, but for a variety of reasons as well, sort of administrative reasons, often hard to access the Italian sources, um, helped to some extent here by the fact that both in the UK and the USA, you can get a few of these things. Um, but for a long time, the actual things directly from the source, uh, it was it was really quite difficult to access. But now is becoming um, more available uh, to people. Um, although I mentioned in the acknowledgement, I would not have been able um, to do this without the help of certain people helping kind of allowing me to gain access to these things. Um, so I, I do think that access to source material is, is a part of it. Um, I think also um, the development of kind of military history as a discipline is, is quite important, whether, whether you look at military history in the old sense, whether you look at kind of newer ideas of kind of history of warfare and these sorts of things. Um, the development of these things as, as academic disciplines has really come on from, of course, the time uh, when, you know, um, in, in the post-war years, even, even that recently, it was sort of the domain of, of kind of ex-officers and amateur interest individuals. It wasn't really done within the academy. Um, and so it, it didn't receive those kind of much more in-depth kind of looks and new perspectives that you, you were getting in other dis, sort of sub-disciplines of history. And it's only really in the development of the, of the, the subject sort of within different countries that that's happened. So it's come on leaps and bounds here um spared of course by people in the early days like michael howard uh but much more recently lots of fascinating new works really taking a global look at the war this is to me somewhere studies of the second world war are going at the moment it's really fascinating bringing new new perspectives but also this more integrated global approach um it's come on here in those ways it's come on in the us in those ways it's come on in italy in those ways and also now, uh, I think to some extent, you know, in Germany in those ways, although military history there is always quite a niche pursuit still. Uh, so I think for those reasons, um, we're only sort of cracking this kind of stuff much more recently. Uh, well, thank you, Richard. I, I suppose it's, it is the historian's story, isn't it, uh, of uh, cometh the archives, uh, cometh the uh, the research project, uh, but it's it's great uh, that you've been able to uh, weave all of those archives together into this coherent whole. Um, so my final question to you before we uh, open it uh, up to the floor, and I, I hesitate to ask this one because uh, in many respects the whole purpose of your book is is to show that wider war, uh, and this is almost uh, me dragging you back to uh, the great man theory of, of history. Uh, your book shows that uh, you know war is about uh, a whole range of complexities and, and uh, wider issues. But I wonder if there are any particular uh, heroes or villains uh, in this particular long running story that uh, you think we should be aware of? Yeah, so I, sp I suppose I'm always linking into your last question, I guess for a long time, histories of the war as well were kind of either 
land focus so that's certainly very very you know exciting kind of stuff that people like to write about or alternatively naval focused or you know maybe air focused but they weren't bringing it together quite so much and again that's something that's happening more now um kind of linked in with that i suppose i don't talk about i don't well, i do talk about individuals in the book right? they appear because of course they appear because of the war fought run and fought by people um i don't know about uh, heroes and villains um but um there are a lot of important individuals now of course i talk a lot about individuals at the strategic level so those who are making the decisions uh, and those who are arguing over the decisions so heads of state of the of the, the, the appropriate countries of course and their various kind of military advisors and staff so the the, the, chief, the british chiefs of staff appear a lot particularly um uh dudley pound uh, for the navy and particularly uh charles portal for the air force although um, Alan, um, Alan Brooks certainly does appear a lot as well uh, and on the American side as well particularly from from 42 onwards um, and sort of relevant high level personalities for both the German and Italian sides as well um, but people who get discussed a lot in the book who are specifically in theatre I'd suggest two individuals appear a lot um, uh who do appear a lot and are important to quite a few of the themes i mentioned are um the kind of who for someone who for a long time is theater commander from the naval side for the british admiral cunningham uh and his sort of air power equivalent from kind of early-ish mid 1941 onwards arthur tedder until he later in 1944 goes to northwest europe um they're very, very important individuals because they run their appropriate domains, um, but also because it links into question some of the some of these other themes of, of rivalry is very, very important um, because they fundamentally disagree uh, about who controls assets in the theatre and how it should be run and how things like you know who considers the anti-shipping campaign to be important, but particularly this question, the classic kind of argument that's been going on between the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy since the creation of the Air Force, who controls those assets? So arguments over, can we set up an RAF coastal command for the Mediterranean? Cunningham says yes, Dudley Pound at the top sort of backs him, Tedda says no, um, uh, Portal full-throatedly backs him, says the RAF is an independent service and we will not be messing with that. Uh, and crucially, Churchill backs the air side. Um, so that argument, how it plays out and their kind of compromise solution to it and where it has impacts on the campaign and the ability for all the fact they were successful, the Allies, could they have done things differently a bit sooner? Certainly. And, and these are some of the many reasons why this comes in. But often that comes down to personality as well, because Ted's predecessor, Longmore, gets on pretty well with Cunningham. They work together well, even though they have a lot of the same differences that Cunningham and Tedder do uh, in terms of how they view the environments and control and things like this, but their personalities don't clash. Cunningham and Tedder, they do clash and that doesn't help. Um, lots of clashes on the Anglo-American side, which of course, particularly the strategic level, which of course I don't need to tell you about, Neil, but fascinating stuff about should we use the Mediterranean, should we sort of sledgehammer through, through Northwest Europe, or should we go indirect approach, soft underbelly, all these kind of things, and how much they link into this campaign. Is all very interesting. I'd say there's, there's those two personalities are, are, are very important, but the usual people you would expect to appear for both sides at the head state level and in intra theatre level people like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the heads of the Italian Navy, Cavagnari and then the Aquino, or um, Rommel, of course, Montgomery, Kesselring, all the kind of usual suspects. I suppose. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for asking uh, for answering my questions, uh, and uh, uh, I will now uh, cede the field uh, to uh, the rest of the audience. Thank you very much. It's actually two questions um, from Sarah. Is one was Europe's geographical position inevitable um, in its participation in, in colonisation uh, and world wars? And two, what are the reasons why the European continent? was always the centre of more wars when compared to continents during the 19th and 20th century. Uh, so it's a bit of a broader question than what's covered in the book, but I suggest certainly for number two and kind of linking into number one. Um, in the 19th century, 
particularly most of the major powers in the world, particularly major powers who have empires, are European powers. Um, and therefore, you know, imperial competition means they're going to clash. And in a more direct sense, the fact they're close to each other in on mainland Europe, I suggest, uh, means they're going to clash. Uh, so I, I'd suggest that's a sort of a, a key element of that. I think uh, I'll, I'll move on sort of slightly quickly from that one because less to do with the book. Um, uh, so do I have any comments from Thomas? Do I have any comments on Axis attempts to presumably replace sailors killed or captured in the Mediterranean? Did they use German or Italian sailors or press gang sailors for occupied nations? So uh, in chapters off the top of my head, six and seven, it does talk about this. And not only is there attrition to shipping, uh, there is, of course, by extension of that, losses to manpower and requirements for manpower, plus, of course, there are all these other requirements competing for manpower. Um, so I, I talk, um, particularly in those chapters, there are sort of interesting Italian reports on these are our manpower requirements. These are the people we need to be um, constructing new shipping. We're, we're short of, we've got a bottleneck in, in skilled labour. is a real problem in Italy around that time, particularly in the shipyards. Um, and in terms of sailors, they're, they're, they're struggling with attrition to crews because also they're having a sort of serious problem with, with losses to, to shipping and crews in the kind of northwest European area. So the North Sea, Bay of Biscay, places like that. So that's really problematic for the, for the Axis forces and they're trying to, to get new people in. Um, the Kaufman papers have some interesting things on it about how they... Um, um, kind of try and cull new people from different areas. Maybe they can comb people, as they put it, comb people out of uh, administrative roles and put them in on crews. And there's talk of sort of pushes alongside pushes for more shipping, pushes for more personnel, but it is an ongoing problem. And they, there is some evidence of press ganging because there are times, particularly in the Aegean, there are examples of, of say, British submarines. Surf, often when you get a very small target like a cake, as they're known, these kind of half motorized, half sailing Greek vessels that are used for coastal shipping in the Aegean. Um, examples of British submarines surfacing because they have to destroy them with a gun, that's what we will just go under it. Um, and the crew surrendering in their Greek. Um, and they're Greek and they're very, very unwilling to be on the ship, but they're doing it for their own personal safety, saying no is not really an option. Um, so they just sort of have to surrender. They can't get on the submarine, obviously, so they, they, they willingly just get off on a on a boat and then the, the cake is destroyed. So there are some examples I have seen of that. And later on after the defeat of Italy, sometimes some sort of rather reluctant Italian crews uh, being press ganged in um, for kind of coastal shipping of Italy and things like this. So next one. Uh, oh, it's from Raphael Sheik. Hi Raphael, I, I hope you are well. Um, uh, I've read that the key factors were the possession of Mal Malta and the role of Ultra. Can you describe more precisely the importance of these two factors? How much was, uh, and then also how much was destroyed by naval forces and how much by air power? So I'll answer this, the last bit first. Um, when I talk about shipping losses, just as we had an example of that table, it breaks it down by method. What you'll ultimately see is, the biggest losses to actually shipping by a long way come from air power and submarines and a gradual attrition over time. Surface forces operating out like places like Malta, occasionally sometimes Egypt, and during the Tunisian came out, campaign out of Tunisia, they're capable of doing huge damage and destroying a whole convoy in one, which they do on a couple of times, famously a force known as Force K out of Malta, also Force Q out of, um, uh, out of Algeria, out of Bone in Algeria. Um, but they can't be used that often because they're a huge loss, of course. If you suddenly lose, as it happens with Force K, they run into a minefield, they lose a cruiser, a couple of destroyers. It's a huge loss. You need those resources for lots of things. Uh, so they can't often be spared for these roles. Um, so it tends by a long way, um, the quantity of shipping sunk by, um, I can't remember what we call the precise figures for the whole four year period off the top of my head, but it's at well over a million tons for both air power and um for each of air power and submarines much much smaller uh for surface forces and mining um as to malta and ultra uh, malta is extremely important 
uh, not just for its base for anti-shipping forces, but also for the other things it does, importance and intelligence gathering base, importance for um, safeguarding the through route when it can, um, importance for a jumping off point for Sicily, for bombing raids of Italy, all sorts of things, uh, transferring aircraft. Um, for all of its importance as a base of anti-shipping forces, not the only place. So the heaviest losses around the time of um, say the worst periods for the for the British in, in 1942, the heaviest losses to actually shipping was their push back right into Egypt, the British and Commonwealth forces, uh, come from aircraft and to some extent submarines based out of Egypt. Um, so it's not just out of Malta later, also talked about forces out of, out of Algeria after sort of Operation Torch and the landing in Northwest Africa in late 42 and the, the start of the Tunisian campaign, they operate out there as well. So Malta is sometimes portrayed I think is the sole place from which it happens that's inaccurate. Very, very important, but it's not alone. Um, and then what was the other part of it? Oh yeah, Ultra. Ultra is extremely important um, and signals intelligence beyond just Ultra. Ultra is extremely important for determining times of sailings, determining uh, sailing schedules. In fact, they break a key Italian code in 1941 that helps them access nearly the whole shipping schedules. Those signals intelligence are really important, but on its own, it's not as effective. What the British get good at doing, and then when they're joined by the Americans then as well, is utilising all source intelligence. So, OK, you know when a ship is sailing, but you can easily miss it. Maybe it has to stop, maybe it takes evasive routing, what have you. Um, actually, if you can have good aerial reconnaissance, that helps confirm it. And even human intelligence agents and sympathizers out of places like the Balkans and Italy sending you useful information, that can help as well. And there's good examples and evidence of that happening. So important again, but again, not alone. Um, lots of that human intelligence as well. I mean, there are efforts that land aid would mix success land agents during the war as well in all these different places, drop them off by a submarine and sail away. So thanks for that, Raphael. Um, So uh, I've, got a, I've got a question from Jonathan Fennel. Hello, Jonathan. Um, can you tell us more about why the Italians failed to maintain supplies in the Mediterranean? To what extent was it a consequence of poor strategy and ideas on the Italian side? And to what extent were they a product of allied creativity and material dominance? A, a mix of two, um, I would say. Um, what, what you tend to find is Italy enters the war on a whim. Um, they see a favourable, particularly Mussolini, Mussolini sees a favourable situation in 1940 where France is clearly about to be defeated. The BEF has been kicked out of France um, and the war looks like it's about to end. So enter the war, be involved in the latter stages of the war um, and maybe you can get some spoils without really losing anything. Um, and that means they're very, very poorly prepared. It mentions in the book kind of reports from the different Italian heads of services in the late 30s, which all say we're not ready for war, not ready for war at all. And indeed, on the industrial side, people say we're not, we're not ready for war, relevant ministers. But it is at least shoved in anyway. So they're poorly prepared and not able um, to do as much to kind of rectify those problems. And it's not helped by a very poor relationship as the war goes on with Germany, who blame all of these problems on the Italians, sometimes with some justification, sometimes unfairly, uh, and actually don't really do that much to help. Um, and they integrate very poorly. They don't work to get together well as allied powers. Or for all the arguments between, say, Britain and America, and also if you were to include, not relevant to this story, but the Soviet Union, for all their arguments, they work, coordinate together well, Germans and Italians don't, I think. So it's a mix of the two, because also the creativity and the learning clearly demonstrates more improved operations as time goes on, as well as quantity of resource and dominance. And I, I, I suggest I have you that forcefully over the course of the chapters. So I hope that answers your question. Um, Emilios asks, uh, thank you, congratulations. Thank you very much, Emilios. Can you tell us what the role of Cyprus was at the time? I'm from the University of Nicosia. Um, so uh, Cyprus is kind of kind of sits on the periphery of of, of kind of allied to British plans uh, for the Mediterranean. Um, 
Cyprus, of course, initially gained as a, as a colony for, for a variety of reasons, but partly as that bulwark against the Russians to defend the Suez Canal back in the, in the 19th century. Because of where it sits and because of a perceived, I think, to some extent, perceived kind of vulnerability, um, it doesn't receive that much, that much kind of planning. It's not perfectly positioned like somewhere like, say, Malta is close to Allied sea, uh, Axis sea lines. Uh, or alternatively, forces operating out of Egypt, say, can, can attack the ports in North Africa or the, the, the shipping lines much closer to North African shore. Cyprus is less well positioned for that. Where it becomes more important uh, in the final chapter, really, when I talk about efforts in the Aegean, um, there have been sporadic efforts before that, but there's a famous sort of Dodecanese campaign in the Aegean in late 1943, sometimes referred to as the last great British defeat of the Second World War. A British defeat because the Americans want no part of it and leave them alone, probably for good reasons, not very well conceived operation. But Cyprus is somewhere they can base their power out of for that. But unfortunately, even then, Cyprus is still a long, long way, but I think about 270 miles off the top of my head from the Aegean. So uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, and so, you know, it's, its ability to provide that support then even is limited. The only other time really is when there are uprisings in the Middle East, say uh, in Iraq, and then there's trouble with Vichy, France and Syria. Forces out of Cyprus have some role then, but again, it, it's more peripheral, I think. So, uh, uh, Richard Carswell asks about uh, Spanish assistance to uh, access intelligence and shipping. Um, I'll talk about Spain a little bit in the book, they don't appear a huge amount. Um, but yeah, there are there are efforts, I mean, being successful in, in that sense, efforts to buy ships off the Spanish, uh, of course, as a neutral power, but buy shipping off Franco Spain. They get a bit from there, but they just really a drop in the ocean, no pun intended. So they have to, what they really need to do is seize shipping from Vichy France. Of course, as I can book that, that, that Vichy French shipping, A, is not enough, and B, is it's not really too much, it's not seaworthy, uh, and, or it's, it's sort of the wrong kind of stuff. Um, so there are efforts like that. And also there are interesting kind of legal quibbles about can you attack shipping uh, off the coast of Spain? And initially, when Britain enters the war, it's got very, very clear rules about what you can attack, naval ships only, or maybe something you can classify as a naval auxiliary. And anything else is not fair game. And then later they do things like declare geographically limited sink at site zones. We say, well, we can sink merchant ships here. Uh, and ultimately, once you get into sort of mid-ish 1942, and the Mediterranean is really a theatre of full-on total war, they just say, to hell with the rules, and we'll sink shipping off the Spanish coast, right just off the Spanish coast if we want. Uh, and they do do some of that. The, the, the Western Mediterranean isn't as important in terms of shipping lanes for, for the Axis. Uh, so... Uh, I've got a question from... Lucy Higgins, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us your views on how effective the Italian Navy were during the war in the Mediterranean. Yeah, good question. Um, I would suggest that actually uh, the, the Italian Navy, like all of the Italian armed forces of often post-war and actually during the war to some extent as well, been the butt of a lot of jokes. Um, they actually perform pretty well, I think, in lots of ways. Um, during the war. Uh, they're joked about because, particularly regarding the Navy, because they often try and avoid conflict with the Royal Navy, but it's because they enter the war with very strict instructions from um, head of the Italian Navy saying, only engage the British in favourable circumstances, i.e. where you think you can win. And they often find they're outnumbered or outmaneuvered. Um, they also have problems with, they, they, they have doctrine that says, we won't conduct night fighting because we're not, basically because we're not well trained enough in it. Um, and they suffer, suffer from other things like a lack of fuel, particularly later on. Um, but then for all that, they, they managed to keep most of the fleet intact despite some losses, particularly some famous ones, things like Toronto, Matapan. Um, and that retains an influence. I've written elsewhere, um, and it's referenced several times in the book, an article that talks about the ongoing influence of the Italian Navy right the way through into mid-1943, but also as an escort force um, jokes about Italian cowardice, I think, fall apart very quickly when you look at this, the, the sacrifice of Italian light forces getting 
sort of trying to escort and often managing to get a lot across escort ship into North Africa, or in some cases carrying the stuff themselves. There's an infamous kind of quite horrendous incident in 1941, which goes back to the ultra thing. It's, it's a uh, result of all source intelligence, but a surface force force K I mentioned out of Malta are able to ambush two Italian cruisers that so urgent is the need for fuel at that time that the Italians just stick a bunch of barrels of fuel on top on the decks of two Italian light cruisers and send them and they're caught and attacked at sea and they go up in these infernos and very, very few survivors, kind of infamous incident. Um, so I, I think one the whole courage argument is, is, is a bit tenuous. But two, I think in many ways they are quite successful. They're just overawed, really, in many ways. Uh, so Robert Knapp, I've got next. Um, in terms of the balance of land, sea and air forces, which had a larger impact on uh, influence of actually shipping, I've mentioned that before. I think it's generally, air, in terms of direct sinkings, it's air power and submarines, surface forces, um sort of less important although not unimportant uh what i would say is air power is really important lots of other ways as well that, are, that influence it so the bombing of ports as well as attacking shipping at sea is really important one because it also sinks large quantities of shipping and two it damages the ports so ports of arrival ports of departure um they get clogged with sunken shipping or that the infrastructure is damaged or the people are killed or frightened off who work there um, and aerial reconnaissance and these sorts of things. So air power probably has the biggest influence, I would say. Did Admiral Donut Dernitz have any role from Teresa uh, Shripada? If I've pronounced that correctly, hopefully. Um, yes, uh, he's mentioned periodically in the book. Um, actually takes over as, as head of the German Navy. Um, uh, has sort of a, an important role in the Mediterranean is part of his broader domain. He focuses mostly elsewhere. But he, he, did, he gets involved in the arguments, um, particularly around that time of Tunisia and the post-Tunisia period, where the Allies have secured North Africa but are not yet ready to go anywhere else. They're also sort of arguing about where to go. Um, and the Axis are kind of trying to recover, um, gets involved heavily in those questions about where do we need to send our supplies? And this is where this thing comes in about, well, we desperately need supplies to go to places like Crete and Sardinia and Corsica now. We've taken it, um, taken it from the Vichy French. We need supplies to go there, but we're lacking the shipping. And actually, this is a problem because we've got aircraft, Axis aircraft operating out of these places that are attacking Allied shipping and stopping them using that free route. But now we can't operate them uh, and we're struggling to keep these territories going. And so it, it's another way in which it allows the free routes to get open quicker and, and really undermines the Axis position. There are these important air bases that they have and which have done a lot of damage earlier on. And now becoming unusable and then ultimately go. So there's some interesting stuff from Dermot's and there in conferences in chapters kind of six and seven again, deal with those later stages. Uh, so you might have time for one more uh, if I can find one that I haven't done yet. Uh, question from James here about um, oh, what about the Americans? How important were they? Uh, I suppose I haven't talked about them as much, largely because Britain is on scene first in the Mediterranean, as it were, especially as France is knocked out. The Americans don't become directly involved until Torch in late 42. They have done a lot in terms of supply before that, so they're not really relevant before that. Um, the Americans are quite, with the possible exception of Roosevelt, read Andrew Buchanan's book, um, the possible exception of Roosevelt, but particularly the American Chiefs of Staff, are quite sceptical of the Mediterranean. They're okay as a subsidiary theatre kind of distract the Germans from Northwest Europe. But after North Africa is secured, they're less interested in the area. They're sceptical of Sicily and very sceptical of Italy. Um, but they do play an important role in the campaign, particularly um, American air power. The Americans don't send submarines to the Mediterranean. They're too large anyway, but also they want them for the, for the Pacific, largely. Um, they do have a lot of surface forces there, but they don't take too much role in the, in the shipping campaign. But Ally, um, American air power is quite good at attacking shipping at sea. It's not had the same learn, time to learn as, as the RAF, say, has or the fleet air arm. Um, but they're brilliant at large scale bombing raids on Italian ports and ports in the south of France. And that causes a lot of damage. Um, so I'd say they do play an important role, even if because they're there longer. 
And for much of the time, it's one place compared to other parts of the war, where in the latter stages, Britain takes a relative lead in theatre ahead of America. Uh, they do still play an important role, the Americans. OK, um, I think that might be all of the questions that I have. Um, just scroll down. Oh, Mike Appleyard. How effective were British submarines? Very effective, particularly later on after learning and they send better types of submarine. Early on in 1940, very bad. They send the wrong type of submarine, very, very loud, very, very large. Um, they also develop important technology later that helps them, better torpedoes, all sorts of things. Um, so they get better as things go along. And then also, what was the effect of attacking the Italian fleet at Taranto? I would suggest, as I mentioned earlier, Taranto is, is they, they lose one battleship permanently, the Italians, two others damaged and take a while to repair. Some damage to some other stuff. And there's a question about does that have a, a moral impact on them? Uh, I would suggest that they remain an influence, right? The, the British always see them as vastly inferior to the Royal Navy. And then later when the Americans turn up, they see them as inferior. And uh, you can see why they think that, because they've got greater numbers. And um, they can argue also maybe a longer heritage um, and maybe perhaps in some ways sort of more developed equipment. Um, but I would suggest that the Italian kind of fleet and being that does remain does manage to sort of exert an influence and they're forced, particularly the Royal Navy, is forced to leave large forces in the Mediterranean when they otherwise wouldn't need it, just to guard against the possibility that the Italian Navy doing something. 